Are we live? Yeah. Recording. Good evening. Good evening, sir. How are you? Good for you. What? How's your day been? What can I get for you? Ah, oh, so Mr. Barman, thank you very much. I'll have one of your finest ciders, please. It's a lucky well, dip today. So, hey? <laughs> lucky dip. <laughs> so I've got, um, yeah, so I've, I haven't chosen my drink yet. I've uh, got it. I'm going to hold this up for the camera. I've got a big box. That is obviously, a big now we're uh, now only allowed to, well, we're only getting, getting a lot of deliveries. Yeah. I've got the only thing I could get a delivery of was cider. I can't get Sainsbury's delivery, but I've got cider delivery. Currently unopened. Yeah. I'm now going to open it and I'm going to pick a cider at random. These were from the Bristol Cider Shop. I feel like I'm doing a sales pick now. This is from the Bristol Cider Shop. We were doing online delivery. And it was 12 ideal, they called it ideal ciders or something like that. The, yeah, the 12 ciders that you have to have. And okay. they're all kind of West Country based. All right. So you don't know what's in there at all? I don't know what's in here. I'm opening the box now. Have you ever had anything from them before? No, nope, never had anything from the Bristol Cider Shop. Apparently, I think it's in, right in the middle of Bristol, somewhere like St. Nick's Market, something like that. Okay. Um, so they've gone completely on, online now. And I, so I'm not going to look in the box. I'm going to pull one out. God knows what's in here. And it could, there could be like rocket fuel strength cider in here for all I know. I just spit. I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to dip into this box without looking. And you, you can testify that I'm not looking. Okay. Right, I've got a bottle. Okay, you ready? Yeah. This is Perry's Somerset Cider. Perry. Oh my God. Six six point seven percent Yeah, okay. Vintage. Uh, yeah, vintage. Collector's card number five. From uh, Ilminster, Somerset. There we go. I'm going to crack this one open. I'm, not, I'm going to close the box again now. We'll do another, another, another mystery one next time. I won't look. Okay. There you go. That's the. Uh, I'll just take a sticker with it as well. Oh, yeah, I love cider. <coughs> there we are. Well, this is cider number one. For me. Yours sounds a lot safer than mine. Really? What have you got? Well, I'll hold this up, but it won't make much difference because it's almost completely white. Ooh. But it's an ice cream pale ale. Ugh. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that probably sounds quite nice, but in is it sweet? Right. I don't know. I mean, it just smells like beer, to be honest, but I don't... I'm going to pour my ass. I wonder if it's picking out the audio now. It should do. Very fizzy, very fizzy, this is. Cheers, mate. Cheers, Matt. Nice one. Yeah, mine's very, it's a very orangey, uh, orange cider. Oh, I've got bits in mine. Oh, it's, yeah, it's kind of a, quite a harsh taste, mine is. You've got a bit of sediment in the bottom. Well, it's, it's not in the bottom, it's just sort of suspended. And mine's got a bit of a, of a, of a different after, like a kind of, it was going to say, it says yeast in here, quite a yeasty aftertaste. It's, it's, um, spend a lot of time in wooden barrels. There we are. Full bodied. I'm just reading the label now. Yeah, that's quite strong. I'll, I'll, I'll just be up in one of these, Jeff. I won't be, yeah. Is it a pint? It is, well, yes. It's a big bottle, so it's a yeah, 500 ml bottle, so it's, okay. it's pretty much a whole pint. This is a 500 ml can as well. It, to be honest, I, I, I'm surprised. It's nice. It's good, is it? It's only got a really subtle ice cream aftertaste. It's, well, but you can taste vanilla. Yeah, just sort of vanilla notes. Otherwise, it just tastes like a pale ale, which is, and it's 5.6%. It's quite strong for a pale ale. I'd say that it, it's off-putting to the eye because the sediment's not s sinking. It's, it's like suspended. So just little little bits throughout. It's almost like a slow motion movie, you know, yeah. in the movies where they get those slow motion, where everything's suspended. Very odd. 
but um, yeah, I don't even know where it's from. I don't know how I came across it. It was just in my fridge. Just one of them. <laughs> just one of them. Um, the mystery. On Apollo, Buxton. It looks, so it's got a Krona, um, like a, a Norwegian or a, some Scandinavian currency. If you take this back, you get, you know, like a, a Krona refund type thing. So it, but it's product of the United Kingdom. So Suxton Ooh. Brewery, wherever Suxton is. Oh no, Buxton. Buxton, where's Buxton? Is that Midlands? I have a feeling that's Midlands. Anyway, enough of that. It was quite nice. Yeah, good stuff. How's your week been? Um, you know, it's not, it's not too bad, really. Um, kind of, dare I say, getting used to this kind of uh, routine now. It's, I was talking about this to, to Sabrina today. Um, the, kids are, the kids are off school, and the, the kid, to be fair, the kids are, you know, they have their moments, but they're, oh, it's they're, a yeah, they're looking after themselves. But um, it's it's kind of a it's a strange sensation of safety within your own four walls that you kind of because you we've been isolated. I know we've seen people on 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 um, conference calls and sorry Zooms and things like that, but you do feel like you I'm kind of you batten down the hatches now. You've got you go out once a week to get the food that we need, and we kind of then hunker down and and just look after ourselves. And it's kind of that. That safety sense, that sense of safety, I think, from your own four walls that you get, that you'll get through it if you can be, if you've got that kind of safety at home. So, but yeah, we kind of got into a bit of a routine now, and um, yeah, wash the car today. <laughs> I wash my car today as well, actually. Yeah. Don't see the point. Never use it, but. Um... <laughs> but I've just been doing, you know, I've just been doing things that I would perhaps never normally think about dedicating the time to doing but now that i have the time i'm doing more of those things it's like you know just little odd jobs fixing interesting, things interesting need... choice of shirt if you don't mind me saying can you see what it is scrum alliance yeah i am wearing wearing the colors today in, um wearing my scrum alliance U, uh, eu gt t-shirt yeah what, what brought that on you just haven't done the washing for a while Hey, just so haven't done the washing for a while. Or? We went out for a cycle ride today, so I, was, I wore this to um, under on top of my lycra. Oh God! Oh, yeah, <clears throat> got to get you daily exercise. We cycled like eight miles today. Me, us, and the, me and the sorority, me and the kids. Is that allowed? It was about an hour. We had an hour's cycle. Okay. I don't see why it shouldn't be, but. Uh... You hear people getting uh, told off for uh, all sorts of things these days, don't you? Uh, yeah, the fines being handed out left, right, and centre. Aren't they? Some police forces are taking it a bit more seriously than others, I think. Yeah, yeah. How yeah, about you? Good uh, day. Uh, yeah, it's all right. Nice day. Weather's out. When the sun's out, it's a nice day. Um, generally, generally more pleasurable, isn't it? And uh, our, our household seems to be getting back to full health, which is good. Yeah. You know, it's not. It's all. It's all fun and games till someone loses an eye, isn't it? It's all. It's everything's okay. But if you know you, you can't get medical help very easily, and you think you need it, yeah, would have we would have taken our kids to see a doctor? Would you? Yeah, but just can't, can you? So, yeah. Um, well, I, I happen to know a friendly doctor who can, with some photographs, can give us a bit of a diagnosis in the middle of the night. But yeah, um, it's a bit. Oh, can't really. Mm, you know yeah so yeah and, and it's not nice when you got someone down you know not well and feeling bad and so yeah we're all back getting back to full fitness now i think which is which is good which is how which helps it's good mm -hmm. uh, so the kids so it's a monday so they've been doing some school work even though it's the easter holidays we're not letting them off mean yeah. mean, mean parents that we are no we're doing the similar thing we have we started to say it's a kind of a relaxed school week so we're not being there's timetable about it, but if we see an opportunity, so they're doing like regular reading and stuff like that and spellings and that, like just to keep their keep their eyes in. So, but trying to intersperse it. I am. Um, they they got some entrepreneurial um, experience today with being paid to help me wash the car. So, okay. Um, each child got two pounds each for inside. Give me that money. Hey. 
What can they do with that money? They can't right, exactly, shop, yeah. can they? Yeah, they put it in their piggy banks. So, buy an online lottery ticket. <laughs> but uh, did you bet on the virtual Grand National? No, I wouldn't bet on the normal Grand National. So no, oh, I, wouldn't yeah, okay. one. I wouldn't trust it. I I wondered though if that's the way that a lot of these sporting events will inevitably go now because they've proved that they can do it and a virtual Grand Grand National happened. But who, like, I mean, who can get excited about that? It's just a computer, nothing, it's not real. I can't, I can't see how people can get excited about that. It's pretty good. You, if you watched it on the TV, it was, it was very well um, designed, how they, it's pretty realistic. But obviously, you know, it's not real, but it's, it looks pretty good. Hmm. Mm. Well, we I don't know what, what a good, we what? had a good round at the social distance in, didn't we, last week? We did. Yeah, it was um, again just like a bit of a free form chat, wasn't it? It was uh, open microphones and people just well, a mixture of people, didn't we? We had one, we had Andy, who was on his treadmill. Yeah, we had uh, Karina, who had a glass of wine. We had Craig, who had a little baby strapped to his front, and he was walking around the house to get her to sleep. Yeah, yeah, we had a mixture of people. Um, what did we talk about? We were mainly talking about the um, the how effective online training is generally. I think. Okay. And about whether you know the the whole um, is virtual training here to stay kind of thing, as opposed to will it eventually surpass the in person training element? I think that's largely what it's about. We did. I also remember. Um, I haven't asked permission, so I won't say who it was. But one, one, one of our, uh, one of our, uh, what do you call them? They're not patrons, I suppose. Pub, pub, pub attendees. They were uh, telling us how they, they had a very pleasant experience as a result of this change in circumstances. And one of the most negative people in their team, yes. the most anti-agile people in their team, since everybody's been working from home, has almost got undergone a complete personality bypass and has become the most positive, optimistic, helpful, you know, um, team player they've seen. And it's gone from one extreme to the other. And it was, uh, a, it reminded me of a few, few people that we've worked with in the past and you probably work with other people similar to this, um, where they were, you know, the most cynical, negative, don't want to do this. This is wrong. Don't like it. And then something happens, mm. something, and it can be, it will be different for different people, but then they just become the most bought in, supportive, evangel evangelical, you know, agilist you can find. Mm. There's certainly one at BT. I can't remember who it was, and I probably shouldn't name them if I did know them anyway, but it was we a We could call him Dave, couldn't we? <laughs> there was a, there was a senior manager, wasn't there, who, um, who I remember, our old boss, Sean, used to tell the story. And these are the things, the organisational narratives that we, we ended up telling ourselves over and over again and telling people that if this person can change. And then we got that person to tell their story. Yeah. And they told them how they were originally, you know, and they're quite senior, so they, they had a lot of gravitas and they, they, they attached their name to, we post their name all over the, um, the events and they'd tell their story. So it doesn't, yeah, just... I wonder, but what makes you wonder what would have happened during this type of lockdown or this type of change of circumstances that would that would convert someone to to that way of working? When in fact, you think, if anything, it would actually back up that this is this isn't how we should work. You know what I mean? Well, we we were hypothesising, weren't we, about the introversion extroversion flip in yeah. the now everybody's in their own homes and there isn't everybody looking at you and no spotlight on you as such that it's a little bit more comfortable for the introverts and a lot less comfortable for the for the extroverts and this person we were, we were told was quite introverted by nature and so it's perhaps they were more in their comfort zone and they felt that almost they had a almost a, an advantage if you like over the rest of the team and so once they were in their comfort zone perhaps there was a sense of obligation to step up or a freedom to step up and mm. the we i mean i was of the opinion don't worry too much about why don't mm. try and analyze why it's happened just just take it just run with it just accept it 
mm. uh, because sometimes you can overanalyze something and you know, kill the patient. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I, the, the, that's that's been something that's been talked about a lot, isn't it? The, the difference between introversion and, and extroversion and how it, it's always been an extrovert's world, especially from an agile perspective. But now, perhaps, perhaps it's uh, the introverts turn to shine. Mm. Yeah, but certainly, I think you mentioned on that call as well is that um, not having, you know, almost like people can't see your monitor, they can't see what you're working on. It's very much take, you take, you have to have, survive a lot more on trust. Mm. You have to, um, you have to, to deliver on your commitments, probably even more so when people aren't there to look over your shoulder. But maybe, maybe looking over your shoulder is, for some, for some people is, is a, is a, is a, slows people down. And then well, the trust thing I've always had a, had a sort of what's the word, a sort of split opinion on, if you like, in that yeah, agile is built on trust, but in a way, it's kind of the opposite. In that there's only so long I can go before anybody's going to really see what I'm capable of, mm. and so there's a fear of well, hold on, at the end of this sprint, I'm going to get judged. Yeah, and so. Do you need more trust here? I mean, regardless of, of you know, whether I can see what's on your screen, at the end of the sprint, if you haven't got anything, I don't need to be micromanaging you or looking over your shoulder to see it. I just come on to the sprint review. I suppose it's, I wonder as well, if it's, it's, if it's harder to ask for help, and I mean from an overhead point of view, if it's more disruptive to phone stroke message stroke um voice call someone is there more of an onus to knuckle down and just get on with yourself and and to you know perhaps that, that more individual individual way of working so i imagine not impossible but obviously you can still pair you can still pair pro over, over uh, remote um, links but maybe that's again more of an effort, more of an overhead, so people tend to work more. I'd love to hear if people are still managing to do that as much now, or whether it's becoming too, too, too much of an overhead that they're more working by themselves. I don't know. Honestly, I reckon I'm not. <clears throat> it might surprise you, but I'm not that technical. <laughs> I don't do a lot of pair programming these days. <laughs> but, um, I, w I would imagine it's it's even easier remote. You get because you can have your own big screen and as close as you want. You don't have to share that screen, as it were. Yeah. Physically, two people sitting next to each other, bumping elbows, yeah. smelling each other's uh, shirts and Must. perfumes. Um, so I, w I think it's probably easier. I, I mean, Google Docs is something that we you know, Google. Uh, it's not just Docs, is it? But the Google Suite is something that's people have been pairing on we've been pairing on well, yeah and see what's going on um so i would say it's 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 even easier to do the mm -hmm. only issue i think is around security of systems with with things like access and firewalls but if you've got you know if you've got your secure access then mm -hmm. um, it shouldn't be an issue mm -hmm. and if government if the uk government are chairing cabinet meetings through zoom i think <laughs> the, the hackers have got bigger things to be uh yeah, focusing. They on are that. in a bit of scrutiny, scrutiny though, aren't they? Zoom at the moment, from what I've seen so. in the press. Uh, and I know some companies. I had one guy that refused to come to our um, linked. Uh, sorry, our social distancing on Friday because it was on Zoom. And he, okay. He, he was quite uh, nervous, not from a company mandate point of view, but from his own um, personal reasons. Didn't want to use Zoom due to the lack of security or the the holes in their security system. So hmm. I know it's not um it's not perfect world at the moment, but um yeah it's it's certainly it's probably the most widely used one I think. Well this is um a bit of an insight into my personality. I suppose all of the episodes are insight into my personality, but <clears throat> you know I was a big fan of Zoom. I was I was using it for my, my coaching calls and things. You know, for the last 18 months or so I used it to collaborate with my with the people when I wrote my book so I'm familiar with it I like it yeah a lot, lot of lot of uh, lot of love for it 
But as soon as I realised how popular it was, my instinct is I want to find a new tool. Really? Because I don't like being with the majority. <laughs> part of part of how I define my 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 site my myself is is siding with the underdog. That that's yeah. my thing. Yeah. I know. One of my things. And so I'm instinctively thinking, all right, now it's time to find out. Um, oh, yeah, and that was that was a thing with with Apple a long time ago, and now Apple's so famous, I start thinking, well, really, but I can't bring myself to go back to Microsoft. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but yeah, that sense of, ooh. but there's, there's, so there's an element of it's. I like to be different. I like to be yeah, uh, you know, alternative, and I like the idea of supporting the underdog. But mm. also, there, there is a sense of well, you know, if someone was going to target a tool, yeah, right, they would target the one with the most users on. Of course they would, yeah. And so I would feel safer with a less established platform, which is which is in, in some ways perverse, isn't it? Because of anyone, they've got the funds and the, and, the, and the incentive to be to invest in their security. But yeah, hmm, not sure that's that's very related to agile. No. Um, <clears throat> on that, th so it's a completely different theme, but on this sort of sort of agile theme is um, we we were. Searching through Netflix, I started trying to find something to watch, and we ended up watching Moneyball. Oh yeah, which I think would do, you describe if anyone hasn't seen it as a pretty much a. Um, it's not really. An, there was a great speech at the end of it. Uh, I, am I going to spoil it? Is this a massive spoiler alert on this? If I, if I go straight, I've seen the film, but I couldn't. I couldn't quote you anything from it. But um, about change, it's, it's largely about change management and change changing of the culture i'm interested where you're going with this because i'm not i'm not i'm not immediately seeing the link but i'm i'm, I'm with you really yeah you see the film though i've seen the film i know right. what it's about i know the premise so so building a team based on data rather than based personalities on and, and chemistry and fit and talent and yes a coach's or a scout's eye it's just looking at numbers and data yes so at the end of the film, um, they so this guy who who built a team, the Oakland Athletics, around that um, Bill James, I think it was Bill James, the the guy who wrote a book on statistics and 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 doing it by numbers, about changing um, one team. That he, his goal wasn't to change his team; it was to change baseball. It was to, it was to open people's eyes to there's a different way. This is that we're looking at this the wrong way. Yeah. you can win championships you can win games if you look if you look at the data instead of going by what your scouts are saying but they didn't did they who didn't they didn't win did they no they didn't win no but the guy but at the end of the film matters again massive spoiler alert if you don't want to know what happens at the end of the film jump jump to, <laughs> jump to the end of the podcast now but um at the end of the film he gets um interviewed by he gets called to boston to, to the red sox mm -hmm. the red sox in boston isn't it that's right um and he gets offered a job at the end of that season where he the first season he he did it where he he had one of the 20 game winning streak with this team the general manager of, of the oakland athletics was offered a job by the boston red sox who just employed the guy who wrote the book on this statistical way of analyzing results and, and and players and they wanted him to go and work for them but he turned it down and two years later the the red sox won the world series mm -hmm. so and i think his, so his, his point was he he wanted to wake people up to and at the end of the, this film this guy makes the 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 owner of the red sox makes this speech about this isn't about um this team this is about changing people's perception of baseball and how baseball works and how how to win games rather than just looking at how to buy players. And um, I thought it was interesting. It's about changing people's perception. There's an argument halfway through the film between his chief, his chief scout saying, you're basically undermining my 29 years of experience based on, on your theory, on your vision. Yep. So, yeah. But he, he said he was willing to lose his job for it. Okay. He was willing to, he was willing to, he believed in it. He believed in it that much. That he was willing to, it's either, and it was all either all in or we don't bother. Mm. There was kind of no halfway house. We either have to live, live or die by this, or, or you know, or, or we can just give up now. Mm. 
Yeah. So I'm I I am a fan of data and we had a we had a couple of good episodes not that long ago. Actually one was in one was in when we were in Dublin around experiments and actually using good experiments to find good data and listening to that, getting past your cognitive biases and being more objective. And I think that's something we need to we need to do a lot more of. But when it comes to creating a team, <clears throat> I am still a little bit more in the old school of you'll know a good team member, you'll know a good person when you see them rather than show me the data. Um, but maybe there are proxy metrics that you could use and think, all right, well, you know, how many person, how many times a month does this person ask for help or offer help? Maybe when it's above. There was another, there was an interest. So to, on that line, there was a point in the film where they hired a guy who was statistically good, you know, in terms of he, he, he ticked all the boxes in terms of the right numbers, but, um, <clears throat> He was just an arsehole. Yeah. And he had a problem with gambling and um, you know, creating a bad vibe in the changing room and not taking things seriously. So they basically cut him. Even though the guy said, No, this guy, you've got to keep tight because on paper he's great and he's he's gonna be great for this team, but he was just a dick. Yeah. So they just they just cut him. But they obviously they replaced him with someone that they thought was was as good on paper if not um uh, if not better so it's just well, with yeah. enough data points you can extrapolate out right so it's about knowing it's about first of all finding out well what are the patterns what are the the metrics that that indicate greatness um and baseball i think is a lot of it it's much of an easier sport i've never played it but much of an easier sport to look at data because there are it's not that complex a sport <clears throat> You, hit, you throw a ball, you hit a ball, you run, you catch. It's pretty much it. Yeah. It's not like a, a full 11, 11, 11 on 11 or 15 or 15 on contact. Yeah. It's lots of complicated rules and things. And so I think finding out, well, you know, people who hit this percentage do better than this percentage. You know, mm -hmm. that, that data is a lot easier to find. But if you can find, and I think they've been trying to do that a lot more with more complex sports. So soccer, football, they started tracking a lot of things now. Yeah. Um, like meters covered, passes complete, and in various parts of the pitch and so on. And I think with, with enough data points and with enough software, then you can do that. I'm not sure whether that applies to office based teams. Do you? No, I don't think it does. And I think you're right. It's inherently a much more complex system. The, the main the thing I'm, I'm trying to latch onto here is that. I think it's the whole scrum thing. It's about if you've been doing something for that long, you believe that's the only way you can do it. True. And yep. It's very hard. This guy, so these, these scouts would not accept this an alternative, would not accept that there is no way, other better way to, that, to build a team than to just listen. You just have to shut up and listen to what we're saying because we know what to do. We, we've done this before. And it was that awareness that, you know, well, maybe there is another way. It may not be the perfect way, but there, there is another way that you can win games. And um, that, was, that was the interesting aside for me, was um, about changing. About entrenched about, expertise. Yeah, and it, about also about persistence and um, believing in a change enough that you're willing to, you know, willing to go all the way with it. Hmm rather than dip out halfway through. Anyway, that was just, a, again, one of those interesting things that we um, stumbled, it's a film I've seen before, the wife hasn't seen it before, but um, we sat down and watched it last night and really, really enjoyed it. I think it's a very good film. I can thoroughly recommend it. Good, good. It's a few years since I've seen it. I think I watched it on your recommendation, actually. Did you? Hmm. Yeah, didn't let me down there. Good. <laughs> It's a nice, nice change. The world has definitely gone wrong when uh, you said, have you seen this film? And Jeff says, yes. Yeah, it's a sign that everything's gone wrong. Everything well, weird. That came up on Friday as well. Someone suggested a film and you said, no, I haven't seen it. And it was something fairly obvious. Like Jaws or something like that. What was it? What, somebody mentioned it on Friday. I it was. You're right, you're right. I can't remember what it was though, but yeah, there was a... But it was something everyone on the call was expecting you to have known. It was a metaphorical kind of comparison. 
Yeah. And you have to say, you said, oh, sorry, I'm going to have to stop you there. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, I, th I think I knew where he was going, but I, I, I hadn't seen it. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of how, that's kind of how things Now's a great time, Jeff. You should be catching up. You should be looking at the top 100 films of all time, <laughs> whatever Honestly, it is. mate, if, uh, I, mean, I, I love my little baby, uh, but if I didn't have a one-year-old, this would be brilliant because I absolutely would. I would be, I'd be watching all sorts. I'd be reading. I've got seven books I want to read. Yeah. But uh, when you've got a one-year-old who, who's just attention, 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 you've got sort of two nap times during the day, but those times are when me and my wife go, oh. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, no, we see all these posts about people doing all this stuff. And today was a treat because uh, I washed the car. Yeah. That was, that was an hour while he was asleep. But, um, yeah, you see all these people saying, oh, I'm getting to do all this stuff, do the gardening and do this DIY and read these books and watch this Netflix series. <laughs> wow. Yeah. To be, to be you. I know. Sorry to rub it in, mate. That's all right. No, I don't begrudge anybody else. I don't begrudge anybody else to, to taking advantage. I think it's brilliant for a lot of people. Absolutely brilliant. <sighs> so any other news? Think in the, the bond other... will have, me and him, at the end of this. Much more than we would normally. Oh, of course we will, yeah, yeah. He won't remember it, but... Uh, some he, level he will. You certainly will. You're going to ask me else something then? Yeah, is there anything else going on in the Agile world we can talk about? I know we're uh, locked in our, um, in our little houses, but... Well, I'm not sure where, where I'll go with this, because I haven't experienced it, but I've got something through in my inbox today for Howard Sublet's office hours. Yeah, I saw that, yeah, go on. So it's a, a, a calendar invite. So he's set aside, Howard Sublet, the chief product owner of the Scrum Alliance, has set aside a couple of hours each day mm. where anybody uh, from the, the guide level certifications, so CST, CSC, I think, or CEC, can, uh, can just log on and either ask him questions or listen to what's going on, almost like a, you know, an open, yeah open session and i think you know, that's something that, that we were talking about at the the social distance in mm. were we maybe not sure definitely had a conversation on zoom about it at some point but these things do merge into one <laughs> where you know as a team making use of having a common team space yeah that you can all come back to so the zoom call is open all day yeah uh, other conference call facilities are available uh, but you can slip into your little breakout rooms for your pairing or your little conversations or even just your own breakout room yeah. just for some focused, quiet time. Uh, and if someone needs you, they can come, they can drop in and speak to you or if you, you know, go back at certain times for, for a collaboration. Mm -hmm. And, you know, almost as a manager, as a leader, as a team, having that space where you know, anybody can join and... Yeah open door policy basically it's an online open door policy isn't it yeah and that is the there's some clever tricks you can do with zoom i know we're, we're we're not in any way affiliated to zoom it's just that we use it more more than anyone else or more than any other well i used i used whereby the other day who buys there's, a, there's a, a knock you know you can metaphorically knock oh, okay, on you. the door it's almost in, like you're in a waiting room oh okay but the, so I, you see the idea, but you can get ways around it by making everyone a co-host of the same call. You can literally set up your own breakouts, I think. Yeah. And you can, like you say, you can create as many breakout rooms as you like, really. Um, you can rename breakout rooms. So it could be Paul's office, Jeff's office. Um, you can step in, you can step out. And yeah, that kind of, um, you can cr almost create a lot, an office environment online which you just open throughout the day it's not i mean that's not a bad thing to do the virtue you could call one breakout room the water cooler or you know the kitchen is second it. life still going do you remember second i haven't life? heard about it for ages no i haven't heard about it for ages but it seems like a perfect opportunity i mean we used, I, I used to know teams that would have their, their you know their their team space would be second life and they would have yeah. one little bit that was their team war room and one which was their daily scrum room and stuff yeah. and yeah they could just literally in a digital format yeah wander from room to room and, and knock on people's doors and go in and speak to them and i think it could be quite chaotic with a lot of people i think i think scrum team size it would work really well 
But anything can be chaotic with a lot of people. Right? A co-located team can be chaotic with a lot of people. Yeah, true. But, it, it's, and I, but I like the idea that um, Howard's opening up his, um, his office to, uh, for other people to come and work in it and, and to ask him questions. Yeah, it's, 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 it definitely models the, uh, the value of openness. Exactly, yeah. And courage. Yeah, because a lot of people have got a lot of questions and um, there's a lot of nervous um, people around at the moment and they don't really know how it's going to pan out. But then you could argue nobody does. But um, yeah, at least trying to um, keep people talking is, is a good thing, in my view. Hmm. How are your uh, how are your clients getting on? Your, your the the people that you're normally coaching. Uh, okay. Well, again, it's I spoke to a couple who said one person who's just said it's just like normal. Really, they've kind of they've they've gone they've retreated and they're they're working at home remotely and it's all they're fairly mature as a team and they're fairly mature as an organisation. They just kind of carried on. Mm. And they've got um, good levels of communication anyway. They, they're quite open about chatting with each other online or um, hangouts or whatever they, they, is they use, they think. But, um, but then some of the others are completely kind of been, they're just starting out. They're, they're a bit more, they've been sidelined by this. They, they don't really know how to cope with it and how to, Scrum Masters have felt the need to, you know, going quite heavy handed on this and, and, and mandate how we should work and how we should, the process, I think has become a bit more important to them. Yeah. I think these, these types of events, they really show, this is going to sound a little bit too judgmental, I think, but show people true colors in terms of yeah. you know, what, what our defaults are. And, and I can say that I believe in, teams and self-organization and you know i trust people but when when the pressure's on i'm not perhaps i'm not even thinking i'm almost in panic mode yeah. what i do when i'm in panic mode tells people a lot about uh, what i really think yeah. and so if i resort if i revert or resort to a little bit of micromanagement mm. then that is quite revealing for me as well as the people that i'm working with and it's not necessarily yeah, I'm not, I'm not meaning it to be a judgmental thing, but it, it's, it takes things like this to help people really see where we are mm. and who we are. Mm. And then we can do something with it. Once we've got that awareness, we can then manage ourselves better and differently. Mm. Well, like, I think, and we won't, mention who, we won't mention who mentioned this on the call last week, but somebody said, um, it's amazing how many people on LinkedIn now have all of a, all of a sudden become experts in remote working. <laughs> and um, they've changed their job titles or they've changed their, their job descriptions to remote agile coach or remote trainer or whatever some might be but um, I think yeah I think it does fill a lot of people with um, with nerves and, and it's, it's about for me I think it plays <laughs> it plays quite well into my locus of control I think because I've always been very aware that some things I've just got completely, I've got, I haven't got any control over this. Yeah. So it's about, it's about establishing what I can control and what I can't and what I, what I've got to trust in what I, what I've got to, what I can do, do with myself, what I have to let, let go up to, to trust of other people. So in terms of the overall management, the situation and, and the, the spread of this virus and the, the, um, the lockdown constraints, those are really things that I don't have any control over. I've just got to kind of roll with those punches as, as I get them. But what I can do is I can control how I approach my work and how I work and how I, how much time I spend with the family and all the, and how we go out and get our shopping and those, those types of things that you can control. And I think there's a matter to, to be said for, for scrum masters or for, for agile team members is to try and establish that. So let's just talk about what is that right now within our control and what, what can we do and what, what do we need to perhaps put in place, extra things to put in place as to how we work ourselves. But what if we just going to let happen and let, let those things um, emerge? Mm rather than trying to clamp down on too many things too soon and trying to establish too much process too soon, is let best, better practices emerge that we don't even know about yet. And there will yeah. be alternatives. 
there will be alternatives. Yeah, yeah it's definitely a, a healthy a healthy mindset to take is you know control the controllables and let go of what you can't. Yeah. Um, I, I'm also, I'm always tempted to sort of take the other side to that as well in that you know if you just accept things as they are and think well i can't control that then nothing will really change and you know change agents scrum masters product even leaders need to at, at some point say oh maybe i, I didn't catch that <laughs> <laughs> maybe they need to say that <laughs> um but saying uh well maybe what if i could change that what if i have more control than I thought, more influence than, than I thought. Um, what would it take for me to get more influence? Yeah, I know. So I, and I do, so this is, I think, this is an interesting one because I think, I know that, I, I know you, you've said this and I know this is a big, um, a big belief of yours about this locus of control and that, and that I think you've said before, certainly that agile coaches need to have a, a stronger sense of um, internal locus of control that, that they, you feel you can make, make a difference. So you, or you can you can change something now this is so for me personally i don't think maybe maybe this makes me a good agile coach or a bad agile coach. i don't really know but i i i don't feel that, that i feel that it's quite strong there are things that i don't have control over and i'm quite and i feel personally that may, helps me manage my stress better yeah absolutely so i think there's a there is a you know, there's a there's a delicate there's a sweet spot here between just you care just enough that you want to try and make things better, but equally you're not going to you know kill yourself and, you know, or, or stress yourself out by knowing that the thing you're trying to think change things that can't change. And you and I have come from <clears throat> two ends of the spectrum in our lives. You yeah. know, you've come from very calm <laughs> classes, just whatever happens happens. Yeah kind of world and you know eventually you got to a point where you think, yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna shake things up a bit um and whereas i came from i'm gonna change everything now yeah to just just calm down a bit jeff just <laughs> change things how they are a little bit um and you know we've i think we've been a good foil for each other over the years in, in that respect <clears throat> and that's not to say that we we don't flip because there are times certainly within some of our training courses and sometimes at clients where you'll be pushing people more because you can see more potential for change. And I'll be saying, oh, man, we just need to go yeah. a little bit, meet them where they are. They're not quite ready for it yet. So I think my, you're right. I do have a big, strong belief about this, but equally, I think there's a sense of being able to play to the situation, be able to read the situation and think, right, right now is probably not the right time to be pushing that particular button. Mm. Uh, and if, if if I've matured in any sense over the years, I think it's possibly that. Yeah. I wonder, so on that theme about co-facilitation and co-coaching, whatever you want to call it, co-working, I wonder if now is it is a better, is it actually a, a better time than any to to reinforce that? To Because we, we've got a, a class coming up that we're, we're, we've redesigned and we're going to rework to, we didn't ever imagine it would be online, but it's going to be online. And we're going to have to work out a way that we can co-facilitate that. But I, part of me thinks that that will actually benefit not just me and you at the time, but it will also make for a better class that you've got, you can kind of, one of you can be um, monitoring a chat window or and one of you could be drawing on an iPad, whatever it might be, while the other one is talking or while the other one is, is delivering content. So. I wonder if this is a good time for other scrum masters out there or other facilitators to ask for help or to ask for um, uh, remote facilitation help or if it, even if it's just monitoring a chat window or monitoring a, a uh, observing a, a workshop or a meeting that they're running online to give them some feedback or to help them manage the breakouts, wherever it might be with it. Perhaps maybe this is a good opportunity for anyone to try that if they haven't, because I know that's kind of how we've always done it and how we've been brought up to do it. Well, yeah, we were talking, weren't we, on, on Friday at the at Social Distancing about the, you know, the, the upsides to online and that, yeah, there will be some downsides in that, you know, perhaps you can't replicate some of the, the advantages of being able to, you know, shake hands and 
had a little small talk at the coffee shop or at the coffee station or something. But there are, there are some upsides that you can't get there as well. And what you've hinted at there is that you know, if, if we were teaching in, in a room, you and I in a room with 10 or 12 other people, and you're talking some absolute nonsense, as may happen. As usual, Jack. And um, yeah, someone in the someone in the class thinks, what, "What's Paul talking about? I don't, don't understand what he's talking about." And they want to ask. Maybe they even want to ask me because they don't want to disrupt you. <laughs> but if if there's nine, ten other people listening to you trying to understand what you're saying, they don't want. They they're, they're probably let more likely to say nothing. Yeah. Whereas if there was a, a little separate chat window which only I saw, nobody else knew they were asking the question, you didn't know they were, they were questioning what you were saying. They might be more open to doing that and get the help they need without even disrupting the flow. Mm. And you know, that, that sort of reminded me of, of something you, you were talking about in this, in this uh, episode earlier on, this sort of um, you know, remote pairing type thing and not being together. And is it, is it harder because you can't just see Nigel over there and say, oh, Nigel, 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 give yeah. some help on this. But again, I think if I'm an introvert in the office, I probably don't want to do that. Mm. But if I'm at home on my own, I've got a little chat window over here that I know nobody can see, mm. or I can have a, a, you know, a, a voice call that I know nobody else can hear, I'm more willing to ask for help. I'm more willing to, to collaborate on it because my, my shyness isn't going to be yeah. a spotlight put on it. So yeah, there are, there are definitely advantages to this. Mm. We've just got to learn to make use of them while trying to keep some of the good stuff that we had before. Yeah. As like Andy said last week, isn't it, is that people still love to see, see trainers drawing. And, and, and that's it. I, yeah, I, I know what he's saying. And I know that a lot of uh, that, that visual facilitation movement that happened a few years ago has, has kind of um, stayed certainly with us and a lot of other trainers that people enjoy watching and, and looking at um, visual creations. But um, yeah, I, th I think even some of those don't work online or don't work as well as perhaps we want to think that they do. Um, I think, I, I, what's the, you know, the, um, the sort of graphic of going from Neanderthal to human, yeah. man, different stages of man. I'm not. I should really know <laughs> who who made that. What did yeah, I don't? Yeah. I don't even got a name. I don't know. But everyone knows what I'm talking about. The various stages of man's evolution. Yeah. And there's been a few stages of trainer evolution. Yeah. Certainly in the scrum space. You know, from yeah. from the days where you just had Ken's slides, which he made in Word, I think. Of, oh yeah, with horrible uh, comic, comic sounds. Oh, yeah. Portrait, not, not yeah. landscape. On a PDF. Yeah. Um, to being able to do training from the back of the room yeah to including actual full simulations exercises using abstract media yeah through the visual facilitation these are all massive revolutions that that started somewhere small and then sort of yeah that was great and it's it become almost a not necessarily a best practice but certainly a very very good practice yeah and i think this this could be another one right this could be the the, the, the next stage of, of online trainer or mm. the stage of country is to have a great online offering as well. Yeah. And at the moment it's scary because I might not be anywhere near as good as somebody else, but I've got to start. Yeah. Got my comfort zone again. But it does have that has its advantages, like we've talked about, is that it opens the likes of you and me up to more a wider audience, a global audience that would never be able to fly to a training session that you're running so that's it we have every course we have someone that's flown quite a long way to come to our course yeah. yeah but equally for every one person that is able to do that we've got 15 20 maybe more people who just can't you know it's too expensive yeah and globally irresponsible some might say yeah so yeah it, it opens it opens up that it, it breaks down barriers doesn't it yeah so, mate, it's, um, it's getting at that time where uh, my glass is empty. Yep. I've quite enjoyed my very strong Perry's Vintage. I'm it's an interesting choice of name for a cider, given that Perry is a pear drink. Yeah. That's definitely made from apples, right? I think so. Yeah, it tastes like apples. And I can't work out why the, 
Again, it's got a picture of a lion on the front. I can't work out why there's a picture of a lion, but maybe I'm missing something. It's all right though. It's quite yeah. It's quite rough, rough around the edges. I wouldn't want to have. I would. I could drink it all day long. Good lord. Uh, just try harder. <laughs> all right, mate. Drink responsibly. Yeah, drink responsibly, kids. Yes. Yeah, so, um, might we be opening the social? Di so, so this week's Good Friday, isn't it? Is it Good Friday this week? I believe it probably is. So maybe we we well well we might edit this out or we might not, but we might try and open it up on Thursday instead of Friday because it feels Ooh. like we should. Feels, feels like we shouldn't, you know, open up the pub on a bank holiday. Or maybe we should, I don't know. It's not a bank holiday. It's not a bank holiday. It's just Friday's any other name at the end of the day, isn't it? <laughs> you wouldn't have another, you wouldn't have, would you have a day off on Friday? Yeah, ordinarily, would, yeah. would you? Would you? In the UK, okay. you do. Bank, Good Friday is a good UK bank holiday. Oh, yeah. uh, okay. Well, I'll leave it up to you, mate. You're, you're the landlord at the moment. But uh, <laughs> if anybody does come, then we might... We might have a pub quiz. Oh. I, I put together a little pub quiz. If we get enough people coming who can, who can access it, oh, it'll be hard. <laughs> uh, a few agile related questions and a few questions, well, not agile related. I'll just leave it like that. A okay. little, little teaser. So we'll put, keep an eye out for the, um, on Twitter, follow us at the Agile Podcast or, um, Follow me or Jeff on LinkedIn and you'll see an invite to uh, the next edition of the Social Distancing, our virtual pub during lockdown. So we shall see. Stay safe, everybody. Yeah, stay safe. Wash your hands. Cheers, Cheers. mate.